you actually got us one minute ahead of schedule. Uh, we appreciate that. Our next presenters are really a tag team. We are very fortunate at the Board of Regents to work very closely with our partners uh, in the Department of Education. The Commissioner spoke to you about the relationship that he and Superintendent White share to try to resolve some of the issues along our education continuum. Uh, uh, seated on that continuum and interwoven throughout it is the importance of workforce development, job preparation, career prep, et cetera, and how we begin to prepare students for the world of work. And, and, and clearly, that is something that faculty play such a critical role in as we move forward. And I know that there has been at times some concern about so much talk about workforce development and what the real enterprise of higher education should really be about. But I think that one thing that you'll find today in this presentation from Susie Shawin, who is the Director of Workforce at um, Louisiana Economic Development Fast Start, LED Fast Start, and from um, uh, Sachin Shintawa, who is the Director of Research and Data from Louisiana Workforce Commission, they will share with you real data and statistics, not just of what the, the demands are, but where the gap is and how you can help to prepare our state for where it needs to go from an economic perspective. Will you do me a favor and help? Thanks, Lisa, and thanks uh, very much to all of you for being here. And I do want to reiterate what everybody's been uh, saying. What you do is absolutely invaluable, and I'm, I hope I'll be able to give you a little bit of context here about why agencies like LED and the Workforce Commission care so very much about what you do and why it's, it's really the linchpin to our being able to meet our goals. Um, I'm just going to start off a little bit um, uh, with, with some broad context about LED. We are the state agency that's tasked with growing the economy in Louisiana, and growing the economy can be measured in a lot of different ways, and it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. At LED, the way that we measure our success is employment in Louisiana and the wages that our workers are able to command. So it's about making sure that the citizens of Louisiana are able to fully benefit from the growth uh, that we're able to drive at the agency. And that is exactly where uh, the overall story of workforce development starts to fit in. But I want to talk about it just a little bit more because really what we're going for is ensuring that every one of our Louisiana citizens that wants a job is able to have the type of job that they, that they want whether that, that's one that pays extremely well, whether it's one that allows them to be solidly in the middle class, or whether it's one that, that allows them to do something that they're deeply passionate about. I know somebody mentioned uh, social work earlier. That is our goal. And if we're able to achieve that goal, there are significant benefits to our communities, to our society as a whole. If people are lifted out of poverty, the education outcomes for their children automatically improve simply as a consequence of lifting people out of poverty. We see improvements in health care measures. We see improvements across the board, uh, lower crime rates, for example, lower incarceration rates, across a whole spectrum of social ills that we know that we really struggle with here in Louisiana. And that is part of the vision. We know that we're not there in Louisiana. We all know here in this room that we're not there. But given the realities of the economy in which we live and the way our economy works, what I want to talk about is how we hope to get there and how this conversation fits into what we're talking about today. Those of you who have seen me speak before have seen this slide before. I use it in literally every presentation that I give. But it's because it really does tell the story of the role of workforce development and education. These, these are complementary and, and often, uh, frankly, precisely the same things. The way that that feeds into the cycle of economic growth. You're all very familiar, I think, with the fact that we talk a lot about high demand jobs and we talk about jobs in certain fields like computer science or engineering or construction crafts or manufacturing operations. I want to talk about why that is because it, that is really the fuel that drives the cycle of economic growth that then opens up the opportunities for all these other people. So it's not about ignoring all the other people in different fields or the people who choose to major in those fields. It's about 
ginning up our economic cycle so that we're able to create the kind of opportunities that allow those people to get the jobs that mean the most to them. So what we're talking about doing is the need to provide the workforce for economic driver jobs in our economy. And right now we have a historic opportunity in Louisiana because we're experiencing unprecedented growth in certain sectors of our economy. If we are able to provide the type of workers that they need, and Sachin and I are both gonna talk about exactly what kind of workers those are, then we're able to grow those industries and they're able to maximize their economic growth potential and that has ripple effects throughout the entire economy. And as those industries grow, we see the growth in the other industries that support them and we see a growth in population and that opens up jobs for the essential services like healthcare, like education, like police and fire services that have pressure put on them by this economic growth and that are uh, uh, funded essentially based on population size and, and the wealth and the community. That's where we see those jobs grow. And then as, as we see the further benefits of economic growth, we see a growth in personal wealth and we see a growth in revenues at the local and the state level. And that allows for more investment in education and further growth there. And it also allows for investment in things like arts councils, parks, museums, et cetera. And this is where we see the jobs growth for our social workers, for our historians, for artists, for everybody uh, in, in, in these fields that often seem to be neglected by workforce development. We want those people to have jobs, but right now in Louisiana, we can't support them the way we want to. But if we're able to provide enough workers to our economic driver jobs, then we get to that level of community growth where we are able to support uh, the, the whole spectrum of employment opportunities for our people in Louisiana. So what I'd like to do now is turn things over. We're gonna do sort of a dog and pony show. I'm not saying who's the dog and who's the pony, but <laughs> we're going to just switch back and forth and I'm gonna let Sachin talk a little bit about uh, forecasting demand. Thank you very much, um, everybody, and uh, it's great to be here. I learned a lot from the higher education perspective um, that we have been missing. Um, uh, I'm Sachin Chintawar, and I am here uh, from the workforce side of the house. Our mission in the state of Louisiana is to put people to work. So if we have to be successful in our mission, we want your support, and that's where we, you come in. If we need to be successful, we, uh, our um, fortunes are tied to your success, and that's why we are here. Um, in the military, I don't know if Dr. Rilo is here. I, have, I, I was not in the military, but it's a good example. Um, the US has the best military in the uh, world if not one of the best. And it is because the core of the military is dependent on training. The training is so structured, and the goal of those trainers in the military is not to graduate a person and put them in the field, but to equip them with the best, the latest of everything so that they are successful at the field. And that is where we want to um, give our perspective from the workforce side, from the workforce development side, from the economy perspective. This is us, um, and that is where uh, we want to showcase what we bring uh, and how you can utilize it to um, uh, develop something that is more aligned to what the economy needs uh, now and through the future. So on the slide you see, our long-term projected growth uh, through 2024 demands just over 66,000, oh, there you go. <laughs> okay, just over 50,000, uh, 66,000 jobs being created annually. You add that you have the growth number and there are people who are to be replaced. These are people who have retired, who are quit the jobs or move on, moved on to another state. So these are replacement, that's the turnover rates that we have to still fill. 66,000 jobs every year our um, economy has to fill. And I just looked up before uh, coming over here, what is the total awards um, 
from certificates all the way through um, uh, postgraduate that are awarded in 2014-15 year, that was 41,000. So there's another, a huge difference, a huge gap that we need to fill. And that's where if the 15 to, sorry, the finish to 15, uh, so Think 30. Think 30 <laughs> comes in. I still have to get it into my head. <laughs> but um, if we graduate kids at a faster pace with the right credentials, so the quality is not, and I'll talk more about the quality as well. How do you define quality is very subjective. You all, go is, you all know what, what would quality mean more than us. But one part of that quality is are we supplying the right set of graduates so that they are successful and when they are successful the economy as a uh, whole is successful, the state as a whole is successful. And when there, there is more wealth then more um, the entire um, country becomes successful. So all that depends on how we um, structure everything and that's where um, that that extra 20, 22,000 uh, jobs that we have to right now search or um, uh, find from another state to fill those will be critical. If that can be filled by speeding up, uh, restructuring, or being making programs more nimble inside our own institutions, that would be a huge, huge advantage. That will help workforce uh, development, LED, to recruit more companies to come over to Louisiana saying, hey, we have the right talent, we have the capability to en um, expand at the uh, speed at which you want the right workers. That is the thing that we can go um, work with employers on. But that cannot be done without you, and that is the big thing. Now, when we are talking about this, um, projections that we do every year, it's not just a pure statistical number um, that we come out um, every year and say, okay, this is the what the economy is, what the 10-year growth projection is, and um, what, uh, you, what the high demand jobs are. It goes through a whole annual process, multiple levels of vetting, huge amount of inputs. Um, and that is, the slide is very descriptive on what we do. It goes from one of the things that the Workforce Commission um, collects is a census from every employer. We know from every employer to administer the unemployment insurance benefits in the state, who is being employed by which employer uh, every quarter. So we basically have a census of who is working in the state. And that tells us characteristics of workers and characteristics of companies. And that helps us understand, okay, if this is the, this, this, these are the types of companies that are emerging, these are the characteristics of workers that they will need in the future. And if this is the need of the future, then we can project out what um, the next two years, five years, 10 years look like. And that's how we come up with these uh, projections. We work with um, economic development uh, organizations at the regional level. We work with our workforce development boards at the regional level. That is comprised of businesses. We work with driver firms. These are firms that um, hire almost uh, more than half of our entire workforce in the state. And they have a good sense of where the industry as a whole and the uh, state as a whole is moving towards and what kind of needs are they, uh, are they expecting as, the, as we move. So that helps us gauge what kind of a demand go, uh, is coming along. So over the last eight years, um, we at Higher Education Board of Regions, um, uh, LED, LWC, and a, a lot of employers and uh, feedback from a lot of organizations are, have able to fine tune understanding the demand of the uh, state. And that is where, that is, that is one piece of the entire um, uh, economy, uh, of the entire supply demand uh, system. And then the supply comes in. That's where we rely heavily on Board of Regions. We rely heavily on our two-year institutions, on the four-year institutions to come up with, okay, 
what, what can we do to um, re make sure we are um, aligning this um, demand. And then this is the first piece of everything that demand. The second piece is how we go about identifying quality jobs, the high wage, high demand jobs that you all taught, um, um, you all have um, heard about. And it is a um, weighted average of uh, the long term outlook, the short term outlook, what kind of wages they are, and then the the job openings in the past one year. So we weight it and we break everything into deciles. So basically it is a relative scale. It's not, we are not comparing every occupation to the national average. It is compared to occupations in the state. We break it by region because we know every workforce area is different compared to what the state as a whole looks like. So Shreveport might have a, an occupation like, um, um, uh, healthcare technician as a very high demand job compared to say Alexandria or um, uh, the Cameron Lake Charles area where manufacturing and chemical engineering may be a much higher demand job compared to that. So all that relativity of what is the specialization of every um, region of the um, state is taken to, into account when we de develop these high demand jobs. And these demand jobs, they change every year. But since we started in the last four years, what we have seen is the four and the five star jobs have very little change, meaning we are not able to supply enough to plug that hole so that new emerging occupations can go up to that. So that is where the disconnect is. That is where we need your help so we can move forward on that uh, part of it. And I'll... Um, uh, let uh, Susie talk more about the gaps that we see. Thank you, Sachin. So, uh, yes, as Sachin explained, uh, the Workforce Commission and many of us uh, collaborate to identify uh, projected annual demand in a number of occupations and all of the occupations, and then identify which of those correspond to four and five star jobs, which are the best jobs in the state, the high demand, high wage jobs. What uh, we then do is identify, and in my earlier slide, the, that orange arrow that I had, which of these jobs feed economic driver industries and therefore are particularly critical in terms of economic growth and the overall health of our communities to make sure we have enough of, and then which of those do we need to, um, uh, again, focus on to make sure that we've got enough healthcare workers, enough education workers to uh, supply the needs there that, that again, uh, tend to increase as we see economic growth. So we divide those jobs into three tiers. Uh, tier one jobs are those jobs that uh, fuel or feed uh, economic driver industries. Tier two jobs are the healthcare and education jobs that are critical to enable and support that growth. And then tier three are the other high quality jobs that don't necessarily have a major impact on growth. And my favorite one of those examples always to use is lawyers. Obviously, most lawyers who are employed in their field, and Danifa was uh, uh, speaking earlier about the, the fact that, that some overproduction there has, has uh, limited the opportunities to them, but those that are able to be employed in their field do typically quite well. But uh, no offense to any lawyers in the room, if we start producing a huge number of new lawyers every year, we're not necessarily improving either uh, economic growth potential or the health of our communities. Um, so that's how we categorize the jobs. What we do then is look at the su uh, supply demand profile, and Sachin alluded to that. We look at how many ag annual graduates we're producing that are qualified for these fields, and uh, then we look at the annual demand that we expect. And it's really almost exclusively in the tier one jobs that we see major gaps and some of the tier two jobs. So I'm just gonna go ahead and move on and talk about precisely those details. What we really see is that it's in sectors like manufacturing and IT, which not coincidentally in any way whatsoever are our fastest uh, growth areas in the state, that we see these major gaps. Uh, we see them everywhere in Louisiana. There are important differences. The types of manufacturing uh, jobs that exist in the Shreveport-Bossier area to support companies like Bentler Steel 
are very, very different than the manufacturing jobs that we need in Lake Charles to support companies like Sasol and the major refineries, the uh, liquid to natural gas enterprises, et cetera. Very different details, but certainly overall very consistent trends. Um, some healthcare fields are undersupplied statewide, but where we're really seeing a real need for registered nurses and GPs in particular is in the rural areas and the undersupplied urban areas. So briefly, the best opportunities that we are seeing for our students, and that's because these are undersupplied jobs in growth industries, they are the best opportunities available to our young people because these employers are highly motivated to hire them and then make sure that they're successful and that they're able to advance through the ranks and that they will stay in a uh, position for as long as possible. They offer terrific opportunities. Those requiring two-year uh, degrees and below, uh, construction crafts, manufacturing production, our P-TECH uh, degrees there for the process technology jobs that we have are very important, and industrial maintenance. That constitutes 85% of the gap. When I'm talking about the gap, I mean the, the level of undersupply, the number of new graduates that we would need every year above what we're currently producing in order to adequately supply these jobs. And the, those number in the thousands, 85% are at the two-year level or below. But unbelievably important gaps remain at the four-year level. They're, they're critically important to us, and that's bachelor's degrees in computer science and engineering, uh, accounting to a certain extent, and then very importantly, data analytics, which is one of those fields that, that's really the fastest growing emerging need um, globally. And then we certainly need uh, various levels of preparation in uh, healthcare fields, particularly the higher level nurses, and I've mentioned uh, some of the, the, the regional differences and where we really need people. So this is the statewide picture, and uh, Sachin and I will talk in a little bit about how we are very well, willing to work with all of you uh, to be resources to you and help you understand exactly what's going on with your region and with the employers in your area. But I'm sure what you all very much want to know is all about what's going on for your institution itself. So I think that's where we're uh, going now. Is he going to do, uh, do you want me just to speak for a little bit? Yeah, okay. Um, so while they do that transition, I would like to just speak uh, for a moment to the issue of quality and rigor, which I know comes up very frequently. It is absolutely critically important uh, when we look at preparing people for these fields that they are prepared for the fields as they are now and as they will be in the future and not as can sometimes happen the, the way that they uh, were 30 years ago. <coughs> But it's also unbelievably important that we focus on what we think of as maybe those soft skills, or I really frankly hate that term, but I'm, I'm going to talk about critical thinking and uh, abilities to work on teams, other sorts of things that actually make people fully employable. I think we can all agree that uh, with the proliferation of massive amounts of information uh, available to everybody at their fingertips, it's unbelievably important that we teach our young people how to critically evaluate sources uh, and understand uh, the credibility of those sources to make their own evaluations as to the truth of things that they're being presented with. That doesn't happen if they aren't presented with the kind of rigorous education at the post-secondary level that allows them under, understand when they're wrong. They, that level of rigor is necessary. We need to be communicating clearly to them about where their thinking might have gone astray and help them understand how to develop that healthy skepticism that allows them to be fully functional members of society. Um, we will not meet our goals if we simply produce graduates in these fields. They need to be graduates that are fully capable, uh, they're skilled, uh, their skills are aligned with the needs of uh, the industry today and tomorrow, or the academic route if that's where they're going, and also that they're, they're able to develop those critical thinking skills. I'm now gonna turn it over to Satin. So. Okay, thank you very much. If I can, if I can figure this out. So uh, while I'm setting myself up, um, how many in the room know more uh, enough about Star Jobs? 
<laughs> have you gone on the website ever to figure out what Star Jobs is all about? Um, have you looked at My Life, My Way? So, it's a very handy tool and maybe later today, um, depending on time, we can uh, work on uh, some of the, can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, depending on time, we can showcase some of that as well. So, um, what we did, and this has been the pa uh, work between a uh, collaboration with Board of Regents and us, is to figure out what's going on, give me one second, with our graduates from every institution in the state. And what, it, what that graph represents is, when an exeter, when a completer gets out of school, how quickly can he find a job, and what is his wage rate, average wage rate. And we can combine that at a program level. So what that is, is every program in, the U, in Louisiana is a dot. The size of the bubble is the number of graduates that it has pro, uh, produced in the 2013 year. And then we um, have uh, divided it, the horizontal axis where it says state average, that is the average salary that a graduate gets two quarters after exit from the program, irrespective of what program he graduated in. The vertical axis is the average, um, um, uh, let me see, uh, the uh, employment, stay average employment uh, rate two quarters after exit from the institution, from the program that he graduated. So if you see, and it's a very interactive dashboard. Um, so if you see the state average, right out of a two year or a four year institution is $18.46. And the state of average on employment is 56%, uh, which is pretty much half, more than half of the graduates who graduate from two, to four, two or four year institutions uh, are able to find a job in two quarters after exit. Now the beauty of this uh, graph is the top right hand quadrant, those are programs that are graduating kids and those are uh, programs uh, graduating kids higher than the state average and have a um, wage rate higher than the state average. The, and this may be for various reasons. That's where we, we, are, we are not saying, okay, this is the best program, so don't, we don't want any other program. No, that is not the case. If you see in the uh, top left corner, you have programs that are training, but kids are moving away from the state because there may be a wage differential, because those kids might have uh, come to Louisiana because education is cheap here and gone back to uh, their home states. So those are questions. This is nowhere uh, saying any program is good or bad. It is identifying where are our graduates uh, going? Are they getting a very good salary? Or if there is a, is there a way that we can align those programs? Look at the bottom right corner. These are programs that our kids are getting into a job very quickly after they graduate but the wages are lower than the state average. Now here's the beauty of it. We can compare it for a specific program, say computer science program across all the institutions to see at a specific institution compared to what the state average for that program is as well. So we can see if that program is graduating kids at a, um, a state average for that program lower, uh, the, for that program compared to the state average, then we, we kind of understand, okay, maybe there's a misalignment. Maybe the curriculum is not aligned with what the industry needs are. And that's where we want to come in and help. We want to, LED and us, we can bring you the data at every institution level, at every program level. We want to give it to you, so, and we, LED and us, we can bring employers at the table, so you can talk to them. It's like, okay, this is what we are training. Is this really what you need? Maybe you need, say, mechanical engineering. I, I know a little bit about it. Auto card, 
AutoCAD or 3D um, uh, uh, or something on fluid dynamics, the newest software that they are using, maybe employers are not um, getting it. So they might be hiring them at a lower wage than what the state averages are for that um, um, program and then training them. So if we can align that, we can push that boundary. What I did, what we did at the Workforce Commission is also br break it down by institution. So this is a state average. So we looked at one institution. It's like, okay, let's look at the one institution, gives you a better picture of what's going on. It's like, and then let's look at one of the, let's look at chemical engineering in this uh, institution. Now I can compare what chemical engineering is doing at University X, paying 30%. $30 an hour, has an average employment rate for that program, 62%. Chemical engineering at the state, the employability rate is 59% at $30. So they're $30.21. So they're doing better than the state. What's, let's look at biology um, and biological science, uh, general in that institution. 43% of those employ, uh, are employed two quarters after exit, while the state average for biology general is 51%. So there might be some misalignment. What can, what can we do is where we are, we are coming in as. We are not, uh, we want to help you answer those questions as well as develop those new metrics. A lot of discussion in the last day and a half that I have seen is how do you measure success or quality? Um, is there a degradation of quality if we push kids out of college in four years? Maybe, maybe not, but maybe we can develop those baseline measures to help answer that. Maybe one year down the line when we come back and we say, okay, this might not be the greatest idea. Uh, to graduate everybody in four years because there's a degradation of quality. Maybe we can miss, maybe it's a misalignment issue and maybe we can all help together and that's where we bring our resources to you. Um, questions? Wait, we still have a yes. Uh, so this is a very short presentation and what we want to do is if any um, institution, any system want to um, want us to come to you we are more than willing and happy to uh, uh, show you your dashboard and what that dashboard looks like yeah i'd like to have access to that dashboard before i actually begin talking to anybody <laughs> absolutely what what we want to do is we what we want to provide is for every institution who approaches us we will give them this dashboard to uh, only for that institution and compare it to for, for the state averages. We are not in the in the business of comparing LSU to Southern or UL because everybody has a certain specialization. Everybody is catering to a certain set of populations. But the whole idea is how can we do better in our own institutions and move that uh, that envelope forward, push it a little more forward. That's that's the whole idea about this dashboard. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Lisa. Lisa's our AV guy. <laughs> is this, I don't think this is on. There Can I get your... There you Sorry for that noise. Um, I'm actually going to go ahead while uh, we're getting this and just uh, sort of wrap us up relatively quickly with a conversation about, uh, we've, we've really been harping on a few different uh, programs and at the pro program level for a while, but what can you do uh, no matter what field you're in to help your uh, students enhance their employment prospects after college or while they're in college? How can they work to uh, enhance their, their future employment? 
prospects. Let me uh, move that there and see if that helps. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so uh, first and foremost, the things that they can do is uh, to choose their major carefully, and by this I don't mean that they should choose to major in computer science or in welding. They should make sure that they are making this decision with their eyes wide open. They need complete, uh, uh, um, it, they need to be making informed choices. Are we having feedback on this? Yeah, okay. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, they need to be making fully informed choices, and that means they need to understand, of course, the employment prospects for the major that they're looking at and the types of wages that they can anticipate, but they also need to understand something, of course, about what they love to do and what's going to be deeply rewarding to them in ways other than the financial reward. They need to understand, as uh, Denny Fu talked about, whether they can handle blood and bedpans. They need to understand whether they're going into an industry with a safety culture or a creative culture. Those things often employ the same types of people in vastly uh, different types of work environments and just understand the culture of what they're looking at. They need to be building their technology literacy. We've talked a lot about technology jobs, but the fact is every job these days to a certain extent is a technology job and everybody needs to view technology as literacy. They need to use their electives wisely. I'm very excited about the possibilities of this and uh, I think they wonderful Steve Beck over here raised the uh, question yesterday about using uh, the electives to create really comprehensive multidisciplinary um, uh, skills in groups of students that can be very complementary to their major no matter what it is. Uh, they need to gain work experience and do internships. They need to understand what it is to be on the job uh, and they need to have something on their resume when they graduate that indicates that they can function in that environment rather than solely in the uh, college or university environment. They need to gain mentors and they need to do job shadowing uh, and they need experience with a lot of the um, types of skills that cross an enormous number of different programs but are in, in enormous demand in the marketplace. Uh, data analytics I mentioned uh, earlier, research methods, um, programming, uh, I think we, we have another one uh, up there that I bet, public presentation, writing, customer relations, um, oh yes, evaluating sources and methods which I talked about earlier and professional communication skills and behavioral uh, habits. And then um, I just would like to, if I can, there we go, um, uh, speak quickly to the types of resources that, that Sachin and, and I are intending to bring to the table. So we heard that already that somebody wants that dashboard right away and we want you to have it right away. And Sachin and I are a package deal here and we want to come out and work with you to help you understand how to uh, use the information that we have available and allow us to help you connect with your broader community with business and industry and other employers in the area. Um, at LED we've developed a higher education playbook to help you understand uh, how best to or some of the best practices to engage with business and industry. But again, none of this is cookie cutter, none of this is one size fits all and we want to offer our services to you, um, of course at no charge, I want to make that clear, to come out and assist you with that. So I'm just going to go ahead and leave that there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, let me take a few minutes just to make you aware of some things. Am I using the wrong one, Harold? Hold on. Okay, there we go. We're going to take a quick poll. Let, let me, let me, before we go into the poll, you can get your polls ready. But let me be clear. We, we went back and forth about whether or not to share publicly that this dashboard was available. And let me be very candid with you why. Not everyone's motives are the same. The commissioner, our office, is very, very um, excited about providing you with this level of depth and detail so campus heads can see it, so departments can be empowered by it, but we are, it is not our intent to utilize this data for comparative purposes across campuses, between campuses. It is for you to utilize the data for 
looking at the institution itself, your various colleges and departments to see how you can align better and how we can provide resources you may not know you have to improve the quality of students that we're um, producing. Commissioner typically says it this way, our role in higher education is not to, to just graduate students, but to graduate students that can compete, whether with folks in Texas or Taiwan. And so we want to empower you with tools to be able to do that. One gentleman in the back um, uh, made the statement that he wants his data, and we want all of you to have it if you want it. So we're going to take a quick poll. Which campuses or entities believe this LWC data would be valuable to your institution? Okay. So what we'll do after the fact is we'll look at these, um, this institutional information and we will reach out to campuses through probably the campus head and our um, provost or faculty folks to be able to start having some of those conversations. Also so you will know the slides that you have seen here today, some of the, the font size were small even for my very young 2020 vision eyes. So um, we will have the slides online for you um, this afternoon or tomorrow, okay? So you'll be able to download all of that. Yes, sir. Will you be available to provide data, raw data, like number of respondents, companies that responded? That's also important. That's Workforce Commission. And one of the reasons that they, I, I asked them to come today is because the, and, and I'm glad Sachin asked the question at the beginning. How many of you are familiar with the star rating system or have used it? How many of you are familiar with the forecast and what goes into making sure that this information, because there is a portion of the forecast, once the economists come together and put the data together to set the forecast, where it goes back out to institutions to see if the information in it, for example, there are some companies Companies that may go specifically to uh, President Geis or specifically to a Department of Engineering and say, we need someone like this in this amount of time, and it might not be reflected because it didn't go through the state channels to be captured. So all of those pieces are available through the formula, I mean, through the uh, forecast and how the star rating system is uh, derived. And that's information that the Workforce Commission can definitely provide for you. And the LED playbook that Susie talked about is really a powerful tool on how to help you engage appropriately with business and industry to get the type of response you're wanting to get and needing to get in order to improve programming and alignment. And so, yes, absolutely. Okay. And I'm just going to say, if you know something that we don't that isn't reflected in the forecast, we, we need, need to know. know. We want to know it. So, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you for, for doing that. And um, the next slide is on the playbook. The Is that a hand? Yeah. I'm sorry, sir. Go right ahead. I saw a comparative of a Louisiana school to Louisiana aggregate. We, this, our data, the data that we have is Louisiana based. The, the, the wonderful news about Sachin as a resource is he is tapped nationally to be on data committees with the Census Bureau and others that he will have some resources nationally that could be helpful. And I, I, I spoke for you, Sachin. You can say what you want to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> We, we could help with that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're going to be reporting, all the ones that are reporting in Louisiana should be reporting all their employees. Correct. And so, um, one of the things that nationally every state does is require every employer to report every person that they have hired every quarter. So, it is not just Louisiana that is doing it. We are tapping into that data to understand what our education outcomes are and how that, uh, that is aligning to what the 
demand is wanting. And that is our, the whole picture. Yes, we have data from other states on employment. Where are these uh, chemical engineering from LSU going? Are they going somewhere? What are they earning? Yes, we do have that information as well. So, so if, if a Louisiana employer is hiring a Texas student at a higher rate than my this is this let me tell you where this that why that is a very good thing for you to want to know and that is why this package deal see <laughs> gifts for you because what what can happen from from the the work that both of the departments that are represented here do is that they have conversations and can bring to the table folks that have um, Dow. Let me just pick on Dow because we have friends at Dow. But Dow has Louisiana-based plants, Texas-based plants. They're in different places. And if there is a question about whether or not they are paying um, the, um, the individuals that come out of those states the same salary are different. We want to know why. If it's a legitimate reason as to why we have to do additional training in Louisiana or in Texas, then we need to know that because we want to be able to be as competitive as possible. And when we produce a student, we want that student to be able to compete for the highest level of job and the highest salary. And so that's why we wanted to make sure that this conversation happens. We got a question way in the back. Hi, uh, I work in a, a college of business and I teach about innovation and the impacts on economic development and such. And my concern is I see a lot on the educate side related to workforce development and quite a bit of the world economy is going towards more of an entrepreneurial mindset for the individual people who are able to work anywhere for anybody in the world. And I haven't heard the word entrepreneurship anywhere um, in the discussion today, a little bit on the innovate side, but we focus a whole lot more on education. And my concern is that I don't see where we're discussing training our students in order to be job creators for even themselves. That's where a lot of the economy is going, where people are creating opportunities for themselves and creating jobs for themselves. And that doesn't seem to be a central piece of this, um, of, of the discussion today. Uh, and that's where a lot of also, a lot of graduate work uh, comes from, is that the job creation tier. Uh, and we've even talked about graduate school students in terms of who they're working for. And it just seems to be, I don't see where that is in this presentation and missing from a lot of the discussion today. I, I, well, I'm going to let Susie deal with that, but I hope that um, the word entrepreneurship had not having been spoken does not mean it has not been inferred. <laughs> because we, it, is, we, it is our hope that colleges um, of business as well as colleges of agriculture, architecture, whoever they are, are embedding entrepreneurship within the curriculum so that individuals could not just get jobs, but be creators of jobs. So although that has not been said explicitly, we are trusting that that is happening. Um, we're hoping that that's happening within the departments and the faculty here can speak to whether that is within their various uh, colleges of, uh, within their various colleges. But Susie, I'll pitch to you. Yeah, entrepreneurship is certainly one of our top departmental goals and it does remain extremely important. I will say that a lot of where we see that being built in, and Lisa's right, it was more inferred than stated and I'm really glad you brought that up. But I, uh, we see entrepreneurship happening a lot in those spaces that I already talked about, in uh, very small manufacturing enterprises, in uh, obviously in technology spaces and so on. So we need to make sure that people are prepared with those skills, but then also have the embedded entrepreneurial skills across essentially all of the programs that a college can offer. So we see that as almost entrepreneurial literacy being built into or embedded in a lot of our programs, much the way that techn technology literacy would be rather than teaching somebody to be at like you know in a program called entrepreneurship at a bachelor's degree level we would rather see that embedded and then maybe at the master's or post back certificate level focus specifically on the entrepreneurship but it's it's a very important thing and thank, thank you. you for bringing that up thank you very much
Hi, Esperanza Zena, I think. Hello, I Esperanza. <laughs> and I want to pose the question. Uh, in all of these statistics that you're gathering, is there information to guide us on females in these high demand, high wage jobs? Because that is a very important uh, piece of uh, being successful across the state. Absolutely. So that is something that we are working on. We are trying to break it down by demographics, uh, not only geographically, but also by race, uh, gender, ethnicity. Those are things that we are developing. What, the things that we presented today, we are absolutely certain about every aspect of that data, that we are like comfortable saying, okay, this is it. This is, we have captured everything, almost everything. One of the things that you brought up, uh, one of the persons from business school brought up about and entrepreneurs. There's a huge change in the economy and that is not just Louisiana, it's the entire nation, the millennials, how they work. There's a whole hu huge amount of gig economy. Um, the Ubers and the Airbnbs and the, you know, all these graphic design work. How do we capture that? Is Those are, those micro and entrepreneurs that are coming up. And that is a challenge that we are working on, both not only at the state, at the national level. And we are having that earnest discussions. There's, um, and it is not just a public sector um, issue. A lot of institutions, banking institutions, from JP Morgan Chase to Bill Gates Foundation, we are all working together to answer those kind of questions as well. Thank you. Susan? And I just wanted to say, in sort of a more general sense, every single one of our undersupplied tier one jobs in Louisiana is a traditionally white male job. Every single one of them. And don't get me wrong, we need all the white men in those jobs as we possibly can, but it is an opportunity to address issues of equity because our employers are coming to the table anxious to expand their pipelines in way, ways that they haven't historically done. So they are motivated to work with non-traditional uh, workers in those fields and help them be successful. So it's a I'm going to take I'm going to take one more question right here, but then I want to get you to lunch because <laughs> and let me tell you why I, I'm not I'm not just saying that. Two more we'll questions. Okay, two more questions. Okay, so I'll do the two questions, but I want to get you to lunch. And then in the afternoon, I'm going to rebate some of your day to you this afternoon. We'll, we'll try to get you out a little bit earlier. But the afternoon panel resources you did not may not know you have, we will also invite um, Sachin, Susie, and uh, Dr. Danifu to join that panel so we can get any lingering questions that you come up at your tables while you're chatting and chewing. We'll do that at the end of the day. So let's get those two that are uh, prepared and then we'll grab some more at the end of the day. Go right ahead, sir. Yeah, one of the things that was interesting is that you were collecting data on graduates and employment and Universities have to gather that data too. Why can't we use your data for our data? Why do we have to duplicate? We are, actually we are not. We are we are not actually collecting you know, data from graduates at all. We are depending on you guys to collect. We are just taking it from you and adding to it. And so that's why I said it is a collaboration with Board of Regents to get that data and match that data to graduates. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, please tell me to wait a second, sorry. You're on mute. Um, my question goes to a statement that was made by Commissioner Rollo uh, right toward the end of his comments. Uh, he made the statement that basically said that the legislature uh, doesn't care a whole lot about faculty compensation because faculty are seen as being mobile uh, you know, players essentially in the game. And uh, I see that being in a, an in engineering field uh, and trying to hire, it's very difficult to get quality candidates in, um, especially with the outlook that we are seeing um, in terms of, of jobs as far as education in those fields. And you really need high quality people who might themselves be making uh, innovations in those fields in order to actually be preparing others to make innovations in those fields. Uh, my question is, how is the, uh, the commissioner, the Board of Regents, and LED, uh, how are they working together to make, paint that picture?
for the legislature so that we can actually get that problem solved? That is a, uh, a great question. And there, we, there is going to be, have to be a heavier lift in terms of all hands really on deck to share that because everyone in this room is a constituent of someone in the pointy building. <laughs> everyone in this room is a constituent of one of the people who is pushing a red or a green button in the pointy building. So what we need faculty to do, whether you do it with your faculty hat and your university or college shirt on is entirely up to you. But either way, we need you to make calls, to have intelligent conversations, to show up at the um, Representative X's public forum that his three favorite constituents show up at. We need you to go and ask real questions. We need you to go and take slides from the slide deck. Did you know that our campuses are giving back 66 cents for every dollar that we get from the state? Did you know to your representatives? Your campus heads are doing that on your behalf as individuals, but the real change will happen when the citizens in this room hold their senators, representatives, and others in administration accountable for, I don't believe Dr. Rollo was being curt. I believe he was telling you what we have heard. And the way we are changers of the game is to pick up the phone, to start sending out emails, and we will do our part to provide you and empower you with the information that you need. The commissioner's thing to staff and our um, PR team are here. Uh, Nikki Godfrey's here. She's our so assistant commissioner for PR. Our um, media manager, Brittany uh, Francis, is here. They will have things on the website you can pull and utilize. Each session, we're going into special session, we, we're told, legislative session, another cut is looming. We will provide factual information for as tools for you to be able to use. The commissioner's speaking, the campus heads are speaking, we got system, system folks who are speaking, we need faculty to speak. And can I tell you that the game-changing strategies that we've heard today, um, the, um, all of the information that you're hearing from both Sachin and Susie, when we had a convert, when I had a conversation with the commissioner about the forum, he said, we can do anything, we can talk about anything you want to talk about, but if faculty do not understand the critical importance of their role and why you are needed. Now, what he also said to me is they are devalued, they're underpaid, there's a misconception about the fact that they sit with their feet on the desk and they make 16-figure salaries and teach one class a semester and that's what the pointy building people think. It is a misunderstanding. It is a myth. It does not exist. But that is the perception. But faculty have to pick up the phone. You have to use the email. We will give you the information, sir. I promise you. We will provide you with resources. The great thing about the last session that helped us um, align and be more efficient even in the Board of Regents, Lonnie, the Louisiana Optical Network Initiative, you'll hear from Lonnie about Lonnie um, after lunch. It's a resource you may not know you have. Our Lewis Network, the Louisiana um, Library Network, resource under tapped that you might not know you have. We want to empower you to know what those are. You'll hear about LUMCON today and sponsored programs. The commissioner talked upon, talked a little bit about it and how the, 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 the um, allocation is going 
down, but uh, Carrie Robinson is here. She'll talk about opportunities faculty specifically have to take advantage of sponsor programs and research efforts. So our goal here today is really to say to you, we have a commissioner that understands the value of faculty. We cannot do it without you. And, we and, that too. And, 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 and can I tell you, the conversations we've had with partners, they understand that. So for those of you who have, have felt, and I, I feel it when I talk to faculty, when I travel to Alexandria and meet with faculty, when I'm with a commissioner who spends a lot of time asking me to reach out for faculty input and opinion, that we really do. And when I say we need your help, I'm not just saying that because you're in the room. When you're not in the room, he says it all the time. And so we, we need your help. Now, having said that, I need your help to go through this line fast. <laughs>